This is the old Civil War song, When Johnny Comes Marching Home. Welcome again to another week of virtual services from the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of the Swannanoa Valley. I'm Evan Yannick and I'm still a member of the Board of Trustees. I want everyone to know how happy I am that we are able to have this special time on Sunday morning to gather in the online space of our choosing and to enjoy the talents of everyone in our congregation. Today's service is extra special. Here are some words from UU Minister Erica Hewitt. Some of us are bringing our best selves to this space and some of us are bringing our struggling selves, including pieces we might be ashamed of. All of us are welcome here, and all of us are loved. Some of us already have open hearts, and some of us aren't quite there yet, because our hearts have gotten a little bit beat up this week and might have forgotten how to trust and open. Your heart is welcome here, no matter how bruised. We welcome you among us. All of us are imperfect, but we're here to drop our defenses and trust that what happens in worship is powerful and life-giving. Together we affirm that this day and our being together can make each of us braver, more compassionate and wiser than when we woke up this morning. We welcome you here. I want to remind everyone that we do have our annual meeting coming up in just two Sundays. The information regarding this meeting was sent this week in a special email. It will be a virtual meeting, but we still require a quorum to make the votes official. If you have not had the chance to use a virtual meeting space yet during this quarantine, please familiarize yourself with the program Zoom between now and the next two weeks. If you need help figuring this out, please reach out to a friend. I'm sure that we are all only one friend removed from Zoom at this point. I look forward to seeing you all there. And now let our service begin. This is hymn number one, May Nothing Evil Cross This Door. Hi, I'm Jeff Hutchins. My wife Diane and I have been friends of UUCSV since 2008 when we moved to Black Mountain. I've led services here about a dozen times. I am grateful to be invited back and to meet some of you for the first time. Please join me on Zoom after the service for a virtual coffee hour. Tomorrow, we Americans celebrate Memorial Day. The holiday was first known as Decoration Day, begun in 1866 to decorate the graves of everyone, Union soldier or Confederate, who died in combat in the Civil War. 
it morphed into Memorial Day, which initially honored only Civil War dead, and later the dead from each war. Since 9-11-2001, some have begun to observe this holiday for an even broader diorama of heroes, one that includes police officers and firefighters and other first responders. I contend that in our current war against an insidious enemy, we must again expand our vision of whom we will honor and memorialize on this holiday. We are losing brave nurses and doctors and other healthcare professionals who know the risks and yet do all they can to save lives. Hundreds of them are sacrificing their lives to help strangers. And why should we not also pause to remember grocery store employees and trash collectors and funeral home staff and delivery personnel and farm workers, all of whom have suffered casualties while keeping us fed and safe? Tomorrow, or really any day, think about someone who died doing what they thought was right to do for others. It is appropriate that we be grateful and respectful and remember. My wife, Diane Hutchins, will now light our chalice this morning. You are a candle that was ignited the day you were born. Your flame will burn slowly, but for a short time. By itself, it barely illuminates anything, but when combined with others, it can light up the world. Don't burn out alone, but seek other candles where you can find them. Up next is our UUCSB Choir, directed by Linda Metzner, singing a Stephen Foster song that was very popular in the years leading up to the U.S. Civil War. Hard Times Come Again No More certainly would have been played at the first Decoration Day ceremonies. Interestingly, there was a satirical version of this song that soldiers sang at the time called Hard Tack Come Again No More. Our gathering music earlier was another Civil War song, When Johnny Comes Marching Home. That was written during the war between the states and was very popular during the first Decoration Day. Here now is the UUCSV Choir. Tis a sigh that is 
Now is the time in our service where we allow space for our members and friends to share the joys and concerns that have happened to them in the recent week. And this week we do have a few submitted. We have one from Finley who lives with Jim and Aline. Finley's joy is that he has learned to crawl in a more traditional way with alternating hands and knees. Though these days he prefers cruising on his feet when there is anything he can pull himself up to and hold on to when he walks. His concern is that after a long trip to Chapel Hill and back on the same day, the pediatric audiologist says that he likely will have to wear a hearing aid in both ears. Finley does not like wearing the one in his right ear right now, but he guesses that he'll have to learn to deal with both of them. And we wish Finley luck and we can't wait to give him a big hug. The second joy comes from Ruth Pittard. She says that she's grateful every day for the chance to practice living love and whatever comes her way. She's especially grateful that her daughter and family have now moved to Winston-Salem after 27 years in Florida and that she'll be able to see them much more often. And every day she experiences the joy of discovering anew our interconnectedness with each other and the earth. And now we have two video joys and one I think you'll be especially pleased to see. So my joy is that um, my uncle that I haven't seen in over two months is finally coming home, and yeah, so I'm really excited to see him. And he's gonna be staying for the weekend. Yeah, bye. This is Barbara Rogers. I am so grateful to be alive. I had a stent put in my heart over at Mission Hospital last week, and the second part of the, the wonderful thing that has happened is that the care team of UUCSD has taken such good care of me once I came home. But I, I definitely think that we all need to be aware of how wonderful the professional medical treatment um, staff is working in the face of COVID and trying to keep everybody safe. It's just an amazing, effort on their part. So I've been really grateful to have been going into the hospital in the midst of the COVID treatments and not running into any problems. Well, that's not true. <laughs> they wouldn't let me do nebulizer treatments or anything that meant breathing out into the uh, air that other people had to breathe. So it was a, it was a learning experience. And as most of you know who have had heart problems, I'm going to be turning around and have a very different life in the near future. Um, so I just want to say thank you all. I've had wonderful treatment and wonderful meals that the care team has provided. Thank you. And for anyone who didn't send in a joy or concern, please know that the church holds you in our heart. Gloria Jackson, who lives in a trailer park, wrote a Washington Post column entitled, I apologize to God for feeling this way. She says, 
I try to remember that I'm one of the lucky ones in all this. What do I have to complain about? I'm not dead. I'm not sick. I haven't lost my job or gone broke. I'm bored and I'm lonely, and so what? Who's really going to care about my old lady problems? I tell myself I should be more positive. I should be grateful. Sometimes I can make that last for an hour or two. A day can drag on forever when you're isolated all by yourself. I sleep as late as I can. I try not to look at the clock. I go to Facebook and I read about all the ways that this country is going to hell in a handbasket. I turn on the TV to hear a bit of talking. It's been almost seven weeks since I've spent time with a real live person. I haven't touched or really looked at anyone and it's making me start to think recklessly. The other day I went to Walgreens to pick up my medications and I sat in the parking lot and thought about going inside. I was wearing my mask and I had my inhaler. I wanted to run a normal errand, look at the chocolates, maybe find my way into a conversation. But I stayed in the car and went through the drive through I put on my gloves and handed my card to the clerk through a hole in the glass window. I took the medications and gave a little wave. If I get this virus, I'm afraid it would be the end of me. I'm 75. I've got all I can handle already with my asthma, fibromyalgia, and autoimmune disorder. The best way for me to survive is by sitting in my house for however many weeks or months it's going to take. But how many computer games can you play before you start to lose it? How many mysteries can you read? I realize that time is supposed to be precious, especially mine is short, but right now I'm trying every trick I know to waste time away. Negative thoughts creep in like that. I start getting crabby. It's waves of anger and depression, and I beat myself up for it. People have it a whole lot worse obviously.
this sermon was hard to write. I gave myself an assignment for today, talk about Memorial Day, and then suggest ways to make connections in an age of isolation unlike anything the world has seen. I wanted to acknowledge the difficulties we face in the pandemic crisis, but dwell on the positive side of things. I started over three times because optimism takes extra work these days. Is the United States of America a country? We call ourselves a country made up of states that are united in common purpose. The United States. In what ways are our states united? Not geographically. Our lands cover 3.8 million square miles with two states, Hawaii and Alaska, that don't touch any other state. Few states are united demographically. We are a multicultural nation. Many cultures are represented here, with little unity among them. The population of, say, New Mexico bears little resemblance to, say, Vermont or Georgia. Primarily, the 50 states are united economically and politically. We have a federal government and laws that apply to everyone in the states and to the individual states themselves. We have a national constitution that takes precedence over anything a state might put in its own constitution. More and more, we see states demanding greater autonomy in education, in criminal justice, in housing, in health care, and in women's rights, to name a few areas. These are the defining issues of the culture wars in America. People in the rural states don't want to do much to help the people in the urban states and vice versa. If we don't support each other, how can we consider ourselves united? Can we even call ourselves a country if the people in one state are not willing to help and support those in every other state? We feel like one nation, less and less. How can we address that problem? We unite for our mutual benefit. There is no other reason to seek unity. For example, we can defend ourselves better if we create a single military force instead of 50 independent armies, navies, and air forces. We can engage in trade much more easily as a unified country rather than 50 independent republics. We can move people and goods around our states easily because we share a common currency and accepted standards for everything we grow, make, do or sell. You don't need me to recount the many ways in which Americans are divided today. There's little hope of reconciliation anytime soon. Too many politicians, commentators, and news organizations have found it is in their economic interest to pit us against each other and keep it that way. We must find a way to become the united people of America. Some opinion columnists thought that this pandemic would unite the country, much the way that the events of 9-11 briefly brought Americans together. Everyone wants to survive the virus and not lose loved ones. The medical science on how we do that is quite clear, and most of us are following that advice. Instead of unifying to fight our common enemy, the coronavirus, we seem to be more divided than ever. I know whom I blame for that situation, but our political divisions are not what we must address today. Connection in an age of isolation does not mean bridging socio-cultural chasms. Repairing those connections is beyond our ability for now. Let's address the connections we can control. Everyone needs a connection to something. We cannot exist more than a couple of days with nothing. We need air and water and nourishment at the very least, and we cannot make those things ourselves. So some people's first connection is to the land, to Mother Earth. Understandably, the first religions to develop among our most primitive ancestors were Earth-based religions with many so-called gods. God is love, some religions tell us today. That must also mean love is God. If two things are equal, either can be stated first. Love is God. 
Today, we see many people follow a religion where love is God. If love is that deep connection to something in the cosmos, love must be necessary. Everyone, good or bad, loves something, connects to something. What scares us most about death is the loss of all connection. Indeed, one of the most horrifying facts about COVID-19 is that thousands of people die all alone, connected to a tube and disconnected from loved ones. Every religion is about connection. Some people connect to a specific God or supernatural concept. Jesus is a supernatural idea. In fact, such a strong idea that millions of people believe Jesus is completely real to them. Where could such a powerful idea originate? It can come only from an equally powerful need, which I maintain is connection. Connection to what? To our DNA, to our genetic makeup, to the knowledge that other humans are our cousins, quite literally. Dr. Vivek Murthy, who was U.S. Surgeon General under Obama, has written a new book called Together, The Healing Power of Connection in a Sometimes Lonely World. Even before our lockdown and isolating quarantines, Murthy wrote that loneliness is a public health crisis. He says that, quote, at the center of our loneliness is our innate desire to connect, we have evolved to participate in community, to forge lasting bonds with others, to help one another, and to share life experiences. We are simply better together, end quote. So here we are, isolated for more than two months, all going a little crazy because of our routine activities that no longer exist or that are severely curtailed. No meals out with friends. No round-robin dinners with other UUs. No games of bridge or Scrabble or Mahjong. No movies, no live shows. What should we do to maintain those important connections? Before I go any further, I want to ask you to be prepared during our coffee hour to share what you have done recently to keep or build connections. Diane and I have found these weeks to have many silver linings. We too are alone in a comfortable house that allows us each some personal space. Still, we are packed together in a way I call retirement on steroids. Several years ago, I retired before Diane did. When I found myself no longer working with other people, I had to learn to adjust. I was not used to so much time alone, and I had to figure out how best to pass my days. About a year later, Diane retired, and we both had to adjust. I had not spent 24 hours a day daily with anyone since I was five years old, and it was my mother. Diane and I worked it out back then, how to be together so much, and retirement has been a wonderful time. Until the COVID-19 pandemic and the lockdowns. When we retired, we had friends who had already been retired and could model for us behaviors that worked for them. Now we are all in uncharted waters. Nobody we know has experience that can help us through this period. The evidence so far is that many of us can live through this quarantine pretty well, thanks to the millions of people who still go to work to keep the country running and fed and healthy. We've had to adapt, though, to make it work more smoothly. So first, we learned that we are going to be alone together for a long time, possibly over a year. Knowing that, what do we do? The most important response is to communicate more than ever before. Diane and I welcome all the time we now have to talk with each other, but also with our family. We connect with our daughters and their families about twice a week. We use video as much as possible. We plan virtual high tea or virtual cocktail parties with friends every few days. We reach out to others both for our sake and for theirs. Even a 10-minute call breaks the isolation and builds connections that satisfy the social animal in us. 
The prospect of one of us getting sick from COVID-19 is frightening. The best way to avoid that fear is to behave in a manner that does two things, reduces our risk and keeps us sane. I don't think that's a really high bar. There have been great plagues throughout history that wiped out a huge percentage of a population. Reading about it as an historical event is one thing. I never worried I might get bubonic plague or Spanish flu. I never worried my local hospitals might get overrun with dying patients. I never so vividly faced my own mortality as I do right now. And I believe I'm not alone in that. In our common fear, no, in our common sense, we realize what we must do to prevent getting COVID-19. So we quarantine and we isolate and we watch frightening newscasts and read frightening predictions and we wish we could just say the heck with it and return to our normal lives, but we know we can't. And that makes the isolation worse. For those of us who choose to sacrifice our freedom of movement in order to help everyone, how can we best cope with our situation and survive? The most important thing you can do is to start and maintain connections. People in the flu pandemic that began in 1918 could see or talk with their immediate neighbors and no one else. We are so lucky to have telephones and internet. If you are now isolated and you're not technically able to connect to people, let me or Michael Carter know and we'll try to find you help. What if, in spite of our best efforts, Diane or I get sick? We are in our 70s. We have each faced dire health issues in the past, but we've been mostly healthy for years now and it feels strange to be at risk every day. I'm sure we're not alone in those feelings. Diane and I have found it to be the perfect time to confront our mortality. We have danced around that topic for years, but now we've finally put it to bed. The sad reality is that some infected people go downhill too quickly to take care of their affairs. We don't want to do that to our children, so we have made sure they know where to find important documents including computer files. If there are passwords they will need, tell them where to find them. If we should die, they need to know immediately what we want done next. The amazing thing is that when we finished giving our kids all that information, we felt great. It turns out that what we feared more than death is leaving our kids with a mess. We went through boxes and boxes of old photographs, the thousands we and our parents took before cameras went digital. This project has been weighing on us for decades, and now it's almost done. An unexpected benefit of working on it has been reconnecting with memories of our families and our children. What better time to reminisce with our daughters? Another connection all of us have with each other is our common agreement to play by the rules. Our house overlooks Lake Tomahawk Park. We can see most of what's going on around the lake. We've seen many people violating the county and state lockdown orders. Do you know what we do about it? Nothing. I've been tempted to report scofflaws, but I don't do it. When a community reaches a point of turning in their neighbors for even minor rules infractions, that community unravels. As much as I want everyone to obey the same rules as I am obeying, I am not going to call the police for minor violations. Maybe in a few minutes, you'll want to talk about where you would draw that line. I was thinking the other day about what I could do to help our community and our country through this pandemic and economic crisis. And I realized that staying home and staying safe is a sacrifice that helps everyone. No, I don't like to be stuck here in this house. I may not have that many years left, and I hope they won't be spent mostly in isolation. Those of you who obey the quarantine are making a sacrifice that should not be disrespected. I know two women 
who were angrily confronted by strangers demanding they remove their masks. If that happens to you, tell them you just finished your shift at Mission Hospital and offer to hand them your mask. No, don't really do that. But it's tempting, right? Those of you who are quarantining alone are especially vulnerable to loneliness and isolation. I suggest you consider starting or joining a so-called quarantine, T-E-A-M. Couples and families can quarantine too. First, make sure you have been quarantined for at least 12 days so that you can be as certain as possible you do not have COVID-19. Then connect with another individual, couple, or family who have also protected themselves. You and they can then either move in together or visit each other as long as neither of you visits anyone else. You can share food shopping to minimize the risk to everyone in your team. And for all of you, my advice is to use this time to connect as much as possible with the people you care about. Set aside time each day to speak with at least one of those people. If possible, engage them in a video exchange. Most of you have probably discovered the computer application called Zoom in the past two months. For anyone who does not know what Zoom is, it is a free computer program that lets two or more people see and talk with each other. Zoom and similar programs could not have arrived in a timelier manner. I highly recommend using this technology. Dr. Murthy has important advice for these times. He wrote, quote, Social distancing is a misnomer. To be sure, we must practice physical distancing to stop the spread of COVID-19, but socially, we may emerge from this crisis feeling closer to friends and family members than ever before. Murthy then suggested four strategies to help us not only weather this crisis, but also, as he says, to heal our social world far into the future. Here are his strategies. Number one, spend time each day with those you love. This is not limited to the people in your immediate household. Reach out also to the other members of your lifeline via phone or better yet video conference. Devote at least 15 minutes each day to connecting with those you most care about. Two, focus on each other. Try to eliminate distractions when interacting with others. Three, Embrace solitude. The first step toward building stronger connections with others is to build a stronger connection with oneself. Meditation, prayer, art, music, and time spent outdoors can all be sources of solitary comfort and joy. And finally, four, help and be helped. Service is a form of human connection that reminds us of our value and purpose in life. Giving and receiving, both strengthen our social bonds, end quote. Watching events such as this UU service is a brilliant use of technology. Congratulations for engaging and connecting, and thank you for your attention. Now, please join me in a few minutes in a post-service virtual coffee hour by clicking on the Zoom link that was in this week's online current newsletter. The sermon has ended, but please stay tuned for some closing thoughts. The flame is extinguished, but not our hope for the future, our courage in the face of crisis, or the love we share. This is hymn number 331, Life is the Greatest Gift of All.
There is an anonymous proverb that received quite a bit of attention this year because Pope Francis employed it. Quote, rivers do not drink their own water. Trees do not eat their own fruit. The sun does not shine on itself, and flowers do not spread their fragrance for themselves. Living for others is a rule of nature. To that proverb, the Pope then added, quote, we are all born to help each other. No matter how difficult it is, life is good when you are happy, but much better when others are happy because of you. Go in peace and good health.